Welcome to the Jesuit Center's Lunch Hour Lecture Series. It goes by the name of Formations and Reformations in Catholic Thought. So if, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the acting director here, Dr. Meredith Bacola. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude and humility that St. Paul's College and the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the traditional original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Our speaker today is Dr. Zachary Uswa, who's an assistant professor and also the department head of history at St. Thomas More College at the University of Saskatchewan, which is based in Saskatoon. He received his PhD in 2014 from Cornell University, and his recent work focuses on the reception of classical literature uh, in early modern Canada. He's the principal investigator of a project funded by Shirk that aims to explore the use of ancient literature and history in the writings of Jesuit missionaries in New France. And it is the research from this project that he's come to us today to share in a talk entitled In Ossiduous Terrace, Jesuit Archives and Latin Literature in Early Modern Canada. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yuswa. Uh, thank you, Meredith, for that introduction. And thank you all uh, for coming to listen today. As, uh, as Meredith mentioned, I'm coming to you from the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, where I live and work on the traditional lands of the Neowak, the Nakawininoak, the Nakota Oyedevi, and Dakota, an area now referred to as Treaty 6 territory. This is also the traditional homeland of Métis. In acknowledging the original inhabitants of that land, I likewise acknowledge that I'm a settler and guest there, and have a responsibility to affirm the relationships that it can foster. At the U of S, I teach classics, so ancient history and ancient literature, Greek and Latin literature. Uh, my current project, what, what I'm talking about today, is at least for me, and on a personal level, one very small step in thinking about what it means to study the so-called classics in that context. There's a strangeness, I think, to teaching 2,000-year-old Latin poetry in the middle of the Canadian prairies. And this project is sort of an attempt to recognize that strangeness. This paper will take us a long way from Saskatoon, of course, but living and working there has suggested to me new ways of understanding my work as a teacher and scholar. So I acknowledge the land then because it conditions how and what I can know. Um, now, another kind of acknowledgement, which perhaps reminds us of the durability of colonial institutions. Uh, I'm obliged to mention that this talk draws on research funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Okay. Um, let's get started. This is a paper about the colonial fantasies the classics conjure. 17th century Jesuit missionaries to the land we now call Canada well understood how to create a new world in the present by invoking the ghosts of an ancient past. These French Jesuits relied on their own understanding of history and its workings in order to define for themselves, for others in their order, and for an eager reading public, their experience in that new world. In their field reports, in their letters, in their diaries, Jesuits make constant recourse to classical literature, reading, revising, and rewriting it to their own ends. This literary work allows them to produce an historical vision, an historical vision of the new world in which the landscape of North America and its indigenous inhabitants can be rendered legible to a European audience. My argument today is that Jesuit missionaries write this version of Canada into history by submitting it to the familiar historiographical outlines of an old world always already defined by a canon of Roman history and myth. In my talk, I will trace this fundamentally colonizing impulse across a series of historical moments. So the texts we'll examine, really the poem, it's one short Latin poem. Uh, we'll examine, invite us to look backward from early modern Canada into an ancient past. But the objects, that is to say the manuscripts on which these texts are transmitted, pull us forward in time and compel us to interrogate the colonial entailments that implicate 
the historical work we undertake in the present. In charting these parallel trajectories, I would hope to draw our attention to all the ways in which historical production is itself fundamentally historical. What I mean is that history is work of the here and the now. It does work in the present. It takes its shape in response to the ambiguous relations between the past and the stories we tell of it. So here I'm really explicitly drawing on the work of Michel Hoffrieu. We'll see that this holds true for early modern Jesuit understandings of the classical past, just as it does for our own work as historians in the present. There, okay. Uh, now, before we go too far, I want to make a very brief historical digression. The poem I plan to talk about is written in 1665. Uh, by this point, the French Jesuit missions to the land we call Canada have been operating, admittedly in fits and starts, for more than 50 years. Right? The Jesuits first established a mission at Port Royal in Acadia in 1609. Uh, here you can see it on a map produced by the Italian Jesuit Francesco Brassani. Uh, we, we can't really get into early Canadian history any more fully here, but it's worth reminding ourselves that Samuel de Champlain established a colony at Port Royal in 1604 and at Quebec in 1608. The first Jesuit mission on the St. Lawrence was established at Quebec in 1625, then, after a French defeat at the hands of the English, re-established with a bit more permanence in 1632. Their famous mission to the Wandat, whom the French called Huron, was begun in the mid-1630s, and they built their settlement at saint marie aux hommes beginning in 1639. That mission was eventually destroyed, and the Wandat dispersed during a series of Haudenosaunee incursions between 1649 and 1650. We'll be looking back on these events from 1665, which, nevertheless, it's worth saying, remains a, a tense moment in the life of the Canadian missions. French military intervention is promised, but not yet arrived, and the Haudenosaunee are still perceived to be a threat to the security of the French colonies in North America. But we don't begin in that new world. Rather, we begin in Bourges, in France, alongside an old Jesuit who finds himself looking back in time and back across the Atlantic, back toward the Canadian wilderness that had long been the object of his desire. As I say, the year 1665, and this Jesuit is called François Hagenau. He's the rector of the Collège Sainte-Marie at Bourges, and though he's in, really, like in the very geographical center of France, at the head of an important Jesuit college, this is, for him, an unenviable position, remote and distant from those crosses and crowns that faced French Jesuits in the mission field of Canada, and that he so desired for himself. In fact, Hagano was once a missionary to New France, or at least nearly so. He crossed the Atlantic almost 40 years earlier in 1628, but before he could take up his post, he was captured in the mouth of the St. Lawrence by English pirates and was returned to France. He made frequent requests to his provincial and general superior for another Canadian posting, but he would never attain the spiritual rewards he so desperately sought in that new Hagano would remain in France for the rest of his life, trying, it seems to me, and this is part of my argument, to fashion a replacement for this missionary experience in his literary activity. And it's clear he wrote a lot. Right? Uh, sorry, not quite there yet, though his work has been little studied. Uh, we have five extant manuscripts written in his hand, some substantial in ambition and scope, all relating to the Jesuit mission in New France, though it's clear that what survives is only a very small portion of his, original, of his original literary corpus. This paper will focus on one small piece of that corpus, a 13-line Latin poem written in 1665 and appended to a letter that Hagano translated into Latin and sent to his general superior in Rome. The poem celebrates François's brother Paul's work on behalf of the Canadian mission. Paul Hagano had been the mission superior, first at St. Mary among the Hurons, and then at Quebec. By the time our poem is written in 1665, he's returned to Paris and acting as the procurator in France for the Canadian mission. I argue that in this short poem, we encounter a classicizing and implicitly colonizing vision of early modern Canada, one populated by heroic figures drawn from ancient models. François Hagenau's short poem is filled with quotation of and allusion to classical, ancient Roman poets. 
References include Virgil's Aeneid, Ovid's Epistole Exponto, Juvenal Satires, among many others. These are all canonical Roman authors. They're central to Jesuit education in the early modern period, and they're all authors who engage with the idea of Roman Empire in interesting and complex ways. Essential to my argument today is the assumption that these allusions to ancient poetry are not merely ornamental, they're generative in the sense that they propose an etiology, a kind of explanation or justification for the Jesuit experience in New France. In his poetry, Francois Haganot rewrites the colonizing impulse of the Jesuit mission in Canada as a heroic performance that emerges from and merges with scenery. But this poem, it exists as a material object, a manuscript housed in colonial archives, and that fact necessarily conditions our reading. The historical impulse that underlies Raganot's poetic composition, this conjuring of a heroic past in order to fashion a new world in the present, finds an echo in the function of the archive itself. So before considering the poem as a text, I want us to linger, if briefly, on the manuscripts that contain it because it's in material form that our text moves through space and time. Historians have begun to recognize, and here I'm quoting now for Stoller, that colonial archival documents serve less as stories for a colonial history than as active generative substances with histories, as documents with itineraries of their own. As I first read Pragano's poetry, I found myself thinking about its itinerary and mind, the somewhat unlikely crossing of our paths, the ways in which these intersecting itineraries are implicated in the work of historical production. The archive is where I first encountered this poem, first learned it existed. It has never been edited and published, never been translated, almost never been read, it seems. I've since found two glancing references to it uh, in other scholarship, and then only in the, like, the very most comprehensive attempts to compile Jesuit literature that have ever been undertaken in Somerville, though, right? And then in the monument of the, the Jesuit mission in Sweden. Otherwise, there's no scholarship of any kind treating this work, neither the poem nor the letter it accompanies. So, to track this text, we move from Bourges to Montreal, to the basement of the Maison Bellarmin, still an active Jesuit community, and the seat of the order is Canadian province. This is the archive of the Jesuits in Canada, and that's where I sit looking at a single leaf of paper, not yet knowing what it might contain, in fact, already struggling to decipher its script. Here it is. Looking at this seemingly indecipherable <laughs> leaf, and, I, and my mind, uh, you might not be surprised to hear, it wanders myself thinking about the fact that this archive, this archive of the Jesuit order, fills the space in the basement of this building between the very foundations of the order's physical presence on this land. It seems too striking a metaphor for me to ignore. What epistemological assumptions about the function of the past are revealed in the structuring of space and knowledge alongside it? Maybe they're just there because it's it's about climate control or something like this, but either way, right? I, I, I found myself wondering as I was looking at this sheet. Um, really, though, our purpose is what is contained in this document in front of us. Let me walk you through my first encounter with it. Okay? The leaf is identified um, only by its accession number, right? AJC 0100.101.2.B. It has long been filed in an archival folder under the title Varia Sur. Alongside a few early 20th century news clippings about the cult of that Catholic saint and Jesuit missionary. The document is a page filled with notes and scribbles, but in the distinctly recognizable hand of the 19th century Jesuit archivist and provincial superior Felix Martin. So, despite the date stamped in bold at the top of the page, 1665, this is rather a modern manuscript, unassuming and, and virtually unknown. It would have been copied by Martin almost certainly in 1857 when he was searching archives in Paris and in Rome in order to find documents related to the Jesuits in Canada. But there's no apparent connection to Jogues. I'm quickly interested in the text on one side of the leaf. We can call it the recto, but the verso makes clear that the manuscript really did begin 
as scrap paper. You can see it here. Martin has struck out his notes on this side, presumably to prepare the leaf for its current use. From the recto, we find an unruled, but still very orderly page of text with archival stamps, the original accession number 101B. There's binders tape repairing a tear on the right edge. Despite its humble origins and its apparent misfiling, there's been a concerted effort to preserve this leaf. We might ask ourselves, why? Still, I press on with the manuscript. The text on the page is set in a way that invites us to read it as verse, and a quick scan of the first line confirms. Qui prius integros vigint et quinque terrans. This is a Latin hexameter. We read a prose dedication, also in Latin, above the 13 lines of poetry and a brief valediction below them. There we find the name of our text's original author, François Ragnon, Franciscus Ragnon, in Latin. Our scribe, Félix Martin, clearly working with an archivist's mind, has added some contextual information in French at the very top of the page. So in this first encounter with the manuscript, I'm still trying to decipher Martin's hand, but the essential content of the text is clear enough. The author, we're going to learn, is celebrating Paul Cagano. He's doing so in a poetic meter. I said it's a hexameter, right? A poetic meter closely associated with Latin epic poetry. And he's comparing Paul Cagano's missionary work in New France to heroic models from the ancient world and past. It's clear to me, I, I, I can't help but sort of have this feeling that this historical vision and the historiographical assumptions that underlie it must be relevant to Félix Martin's decision to preserve a copy of this poem for his archive in Montreal. Martin was among the first group of Jesuits to return to Canada in 1842, after their earlier suppression and eventual reinstatement. And he would soon succeed Pierre Chazelle as provincial superior. In that role, he led a concerted effort to reconstitute a Jesuit archive in Canada, to found an archive and thereby find a history for his order in this moment of return and refoundation. Even if this leaf, even if this poem is just one small example from a larger program of archival work, nevertheless, Martin's 19th century copy of a 17th century Latin poem is exemplary to me in the way it simultaneously looks back to a point of origin for Jesuits in Canada and forward to a moment in which that past might be re-inscribed in his present. So historiographical appraisals of the Jesuit experiment in early Canada had long understood the 17th century with its stories of evangelization and martyrdom as a kind of quote unquote heroic age upon which the fledgling nation was founded. This is particularly true among Martin's 19th century contemporaries. In this context, Martin's work as an archivist for a newly established Jesuit order in Canada can be seen as central to his work for the order. Luca Codignola elaborates. Martin and the new Canadian Jesuits regarded themselves as the heirs of their heroic confrères in France, because the memories of their deeds, even of their violent deaths, seem to have been lost in the new Canada. They looked to the past in search of historical documentation that would establish a sort of continuing spiritual genealogy. We'll see that this resonates deeply with the historiographical assumptions of Ragnarok's poem and helps us understand how this text might have made its way from its origins in 17th century Bourges to an archive in Montreal. In Martin's archive, as in Ragnarok's poem, the past is made to serve a purpose in the here and now. These Jesuits rely on historical production, the stories they tell about the past in order to find who they are in the present. Anne Laura Stoller characterizes colonial archives as sites of the expectant and conjured. It's with this in mind that we ask ourselves, well, that I ask myself, what Martin might be trying to conjure by copying texts like this one, by carrying them to Canada, by cataloging them in the archives of the Jesuit Collège de Sainte Marie in Montreal. These archival movements remind us that colonial documents are not mere sources. They're engaged actively and preemptively in the production of history. 
The 17th century original of our poem is an important document. Here it is. In fact, this is uh, held at the Jesuit archives of the province of France in Vaughan, just outside Paris. I was lucky enough to be able to take this picture myself when I spent a year in Paris on sabbatical. Um, it's still extant, and, and it turns out it's, it, you know, it's, it's worth consulting, especially because it's a heck of a lot easier to read. As you can see, a lot easier to read in a beautiful sort of like early modern humanistic script, right? Just lo lovely, right? At any rate. Um, but the later copy, the 19th century copy of the manuscript is interesting to me uh, because it illustrates for us the work that archival sources might accomplish not only in the context of their production, but in the context of their consumption. So uh, I need to do a little bit of background before we can talk about the poem itself. Our understanding of the early contact period in what is now Canada has long been defined by archival sources like this one, like this poem that I'm working with, right? defined by the writings of Jesuit missionaries, whose education, whose entire worldview is permeated with classical learning and the cultural assumptions that undergird it. My argument in this paper presumes that we can better understand the ways that early modern texts shape contemporary discourses of colonization if we also look backwards, look backwards at the ancient literary sources that inform the work of these Jesuit authors. Because the famously systematized Jesuit education is predicated on classical learning from this period, we need to track these references with careful attention and interrogate the thought worlds that they construct in the process. And the ancient past, especially as represented in classical literature, is a powerful reference then for Jesuit missionaries in their attempts to process for themselves and represent to others the nature of their experience in the landscape of Canada and among the indigenous inhabitants of that land. Frank Kallendorf has argued that the new world was not so much discovered as a result of transoceanic travel, but invented in a process by which the new was accommodated to the old. I understand Jesuit mission writing as an important participant in that process of invention. Jesuit literature in New France serves as a fundamental tool in a colonizing that remakes the missionary field in the image of the metropolitan center. And of course, indigenous scholars working on early Canadian history have long recognized the inverse of this formulation. The impulse to write indigenous peoples and indigenous spaces into the framework of European history broadly conceived was likewise a form of epistemic violence that occluded indigenous epistemologies and the agency of indigenous individuals and communities. Scott Manning Stevens has argued that, and I quote, the charge of Jesuit historiography was to historicize space and by extension to stake political and cultural claims on the original inhabitants of the place. Georges Sui sees this as conscious historical revisionism set in service of dispossession. But this epistemic violence doesn't need to be conscious to be an inevitable consequence of Jesuit historiographies. Early modern Jesuit understandings of the past assume that history always takes a particular shape, one rooted in the colonial logic and defined by classical models. By writing the new world into an historical pattern legible to European audiences, Jesuit authors occlude any potential histories that could have existed outside such constraints. In this understanding, the new world really is new in the sense that the version of early Canadian history Jesuit authors offer is the product of an epistemological framework that explicitly asserts the worldlessness of indigenous peoples on this land. In fact, Hagenau constructs an explicit link between his act of poetic commemoration and French settlement in the New World. With his dedicatory formula, he addresses his poem to French settlers, Polony, in New France. In the lines that follow, Hagenau writes his brother Paul's heroic efforts in defense of that settlement as the natural product of an historical understanding rooted in classical models. The poem imagines a new world in which French settlement is inevitable, if only because that settlement already has a deeply rooted past that justifies its ongoing presence. and presence. In fact. This discursive framework in which ancient history is deployed in service of French colonial ambitions is hardly uni unique to Hagenau's poetry. It's become commonplace at this point to recognize the influence of classical literature on early modern Jesuit writings across their diverse spheres of activity. And there's even a growing corpus of scholarship on Jesuit Latin literature in 
France. This is still a very new field. There aren't a lot of people working on early modern Canada who are interested in Latin, but there are a few, and I collect some references here. We can't explore today all the different ways Jesuit authors in New France use the classical past to frame their experience, but I'll ask you to trust me when I say that Francois Hagenot's poetry isn't unique in its context, but this text merits further study, especially because the poetic form in which Francois Hagenot was working is uniquely suited as a vehicle for the historical vision that informs Jesuit engagement with classical models. Many contemporary Jesuit authors quote classical literature as part of their own original compositions. But Hagenot's poem is all quotation, all allusion, or nearly so. It's composed in phrases, half lines, even full lines from classical Latin poetry. The result is a patchwork text pieced together from the work of other poets. We call a poem like this a cento. What is original here in Hagenot's poem, beyond the technical challenge of collecting appropriate quotations, deploying them in a meaningful pattern is the interplay of poetic contexts. Hagenot relies on his audience's ability to recognize the sources of his quotations because the poem's broader historical vision takes shape in this movement between ancient Roman source and modern meaning. That's what we're going to explore now. Let me just bring the poem up. So here it is in Latin. I will do my, we don't need to read Latin able to make sense of this, I promise you. I'll make sure we have translations all the way through. But I think it's worth seeing the poem in its original form. So the poem, this poem, is a panegyric written in celebration of the author's younger brother, Paul Hagenau, whom I've already mentioned uh, briefly. But let's just sort of collect in one place sort of a brief history of his time in New France. Right? Uh, he was a long-serving missionary in New France. Uh, by 1665, he's now in Paris, acting as the procurator of the Canadian mission. He first arrived at Quebec in 1636. He was superior of the mission of the Wandat in the French called Hurons from 1645 to 1650, which means he witnessed firsthand the destruction of Wandake and the exile of the Wandat in 1649. After fleeing Wandake for Quebec, Hagenau was made superior of the Canadian missions, in which post he served from 1650 to 1653. He returned to France in 1662, where he was made procurator. And as I, as I alluded to at the beginning of the talk, the poem is written at a, at a tense moment in the life of the Canadian mission. Paul Hagenot had been requesting more substantial French military interventions in the colony at least since 1661 in an attempt to counter the threat of Haudenosaunee incursions. He would continued to advocate for this course of action upon his arrival in Paris as procurator, and by the time Francois is composing this poem in early 1665, the troops had been promised but had not yet arrived in France. Here it is. Here's my sort of very literal translation into English. This is not beautiful poetry. And you might eventually question the Latin is beautiful poetry either, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Okay, my translation certainly is not. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, uh, by the time Francois was composing this poem early in 1665, the troops had been promised but had not yet arrived in France. And the last lines of the poem suggest their imminent arrival and dramatize Paul Hagenot's role in securing their presence. Thinking of you, he sends an armed force against Throughout this poem, Paul Hagenot is depicted as heroic in the face of suffering. He's potent, he's powerful or capable, but he's also per fossus puris amare, struck by bitter tears. The poem celebrates Hagenot's missionary work in the new world and likens his task to an epic labor. Here, that labor is undertaken especially on behalf of the French settlers to whom the poem is dedicated. Indigenous peoples do appear in the text, but only unnamed and only in a collective. The hostess of Trox, the cruel enemy and the daimon, devil of line nine, does seem to refer to the devil himself, but it asks contemporary readers also to imagine the Haudenosaunee, who had long offered the most concerted resistance to the French imperial designs in the eastern woodlands of North America. The characterization of the Haudenosaunee as cruel, as a cruel and savage enemy as, as a hostess at Trox, very literally, right, is perhaps the most persistent feature of contemporary French colonial discourse. In fact, this characterization responds directly to Paul Hagenot's own depiction of the Haudenosaunee in a series of Latin letters that he wrote describing the destruction of Fundake. Conversely, 
again, Smisara, that, that the wretched tribe in line eight must be the one that dispersed in the years following the 1649 destruction of Dake, and their portrayal as a miserable or wretched people is common in ostensibly sympathetic Jesuit depictions that make them the ideal, quote unquote, beneficiaries of a French civilization in the New World. In fact, Hagano is the only named actor in the entire text, his heroic agency seemingly without limit. The depiction of Hagano as epic hero depends on a series of classical references and structure, the form and content of this poem. We can't track all these references, but I'd quickly highlight, just to get started, uh, the second line, right, which quotes a, a famous, really a, a famous line, the first line uh, from Ovid's poem, The Epistola in Sponto. It's a complex illusion. We're not going to get into great detail right now. Um, but for our purposes today, I would suggest that this quotation from an extremely well-known, extremely widely read source text right at the beginning of Hagenau's poem signals that the reader should expect to recognize further allusions. Right? A big flashing quote means, okay, you're going to find more of these. So I'm just going to focus on a few lines towards the end, in the middle and towards the end, that help illustrate very explicitly the epic character of Hagenau's work. So the fifth line presents a complex group of illusions that serve to highlight that epic character. Right? Here, Hagano is mighty in counsel and deed and daring exploits. It draws, again, from Ovid, this time from his epic poem, The Metamorphoses, from an ancient Latin translation of the Iliad, from Virgil, right? from the later epic poet, Silius Italicus. But I want us to look more closely at the next line, which further underscores, especially for readers familiar with poetry, this framework for Ragano's poem, even as it introduces now explicitly the theme of its subject's suffering. Paul Ragano in the Latin is multigemens curis quanimum per fossus amaris, lamenting much, or really like groaning deeply, right? He's pierced in the heart with bitter cares. If you have read the Aeneid, especially if read the Aeneid dozens of times as Jesuit authors in the early modern period have, you immediately recognize these first two words, multigamens, multigamens. Four lines in the Aeneid begin with this exact formula, three of them referring to Aeneas himself, and each of those three instances marks an important <laughs> aspect of Aeneas's labor in that epic. That is to say, this formula in the Aeneid comes at kind of turning points in Aeneas's journey right, in the first six books of that poem. He first laments at the sight of the reliefs depicting the fall of Troy on the Temple of Juno at Carthage. This is sort of the first sort of essential episode in the first six books of the poem. Next, he groans deeply because struck by love for Dido. And then finally, he mourns the death of Palinurus. Those latter two instances also match very closely the metrical pattern of this line in Hagnos poem, but we don't need to get into Latin examiner and Latin prosody, right? With this series of epic resonances, uh, Hagano links his subject, the programmatic Roman hero Aeneas, whose labors would eventually culminate in the founding of Rome itself. The result of this series of intertexts is an historical vision that links Roman Empire and the old world to French imperial ambitions in the new. In this reading, Paul Hagano will be the heroic figure through whom such colonial fantasies The most sustained quotation in this poem actually comes from a Roman satire by the poet Juvenal. Uh, perhaps a strange choice at first glance, but one that makes more sense when we understand the original context of the illusion. Hagenau quotes a full line and a half from Juvenal's eighth, uh, eighth satire. That ancient poem is a sustained piece of protracted, kind of didactic poetry, teaching poetry, addressed to a Ponticus and arguing that virtue in one's actions is more important than nobility. In an extended section of the speech, Juvenal supports his argument by recourse to examples from history, right? parading before the reader a troop of well-bred villains and fools, followed by civic heroes whose common birth was no impediment to their virtuous deeds on behalf of Rome. So in, in lines 11 to 13 of our poem, sorry, these are actually this is not 6, 7, 8, this is 11, 12, 13. Uh, Francois Hagenau draws on one of these examples, perhaps the most famous, in order to fashion for his brother 
and for the Jesuit mission in New France, an identity rooted in the presumed continuity between ancient and modern. So I'm, I'm quoting him now. Since he sends from here an armed force against frightened enemies and works among every people, France, both old and new, that is say, France in Europe and France in North America, justly hails him Pater Patriae, that is to say, Father of the Fatherland. This is an extended quotation directly pulled from Juvenal's account of Cicero's defense of Rome against the conspiracy of Catiline. In Juvenal, Cicero, right, this famous Roman statesman, who is a new man and lowborn, sets up an armed force to protect the city and labors over every hill of Rome. And just as Rome hails Cicero pater patriae for his defense of the city, so France hails Paganum. In this illusion, France is likened to Rome, Hagano to Cicero, right? And Hagano, you might recognize, by his religious office already is, is pater, he's, he's père, he's a father, he's a priest, right? But his heroic deeds make him also the father of this fatherland, right? And then finally, just as a way of sort of ending my discussion of this, this sort of quotations, um, notice too that this quotation moves the reader from the legendary context of epic poetry, right, the mythological context of epic, into a firmly historical sense. Cicero was a real Roman politician, statesman, orator, right? As the poem draws to a close, it reminds us that this literary work is set in service of a particular historical vision. The reader is asked to understand Paul's labors as epic in scale, but nevertheless the product of familiar historical events. So, the classical models that underlie our poem remind us of the discursive patterns that shape our histories, but also how those patterns come to shape our very experiences. The classical past offers a kind of explanation for the epic virtue and epic suffering of Paul Hagenon. That etiology, that explanation in turn, suggests a teleological vision of history that allows Francois Hagenon to imagine a future in which his brother might be lauded as epic hero as a pater patriae in this new world. In this short, really very short, Gentonic poem, but likewise throughout the corpus of Jesuit Latin literature in New France, we see classical quotations that serve to fashion a missionary identity rooted in this sense of continuity between the old and the new. These Jesuit heroes can remake in this new world a Christian empire that reflects the epic virtues of the classical past. At the heart of this vision is a set assumptions, historiographical assumptions about what actually counts as history. Francois Hagenot understands well the power of historical production to accomplish political ends in the here and the now. And he invents a genealogy for a history of the new world wholly dependent on long-established histories of the old. Now, uh, we, might, we might think that Hagenot's poetic composition in this text is in many ways unremarkable, even adequate, we could question its literary value. I welcome you to do so if that were a useful category of critical analysis. But no matter the aesthetic quality of the poem, as a classicist living and working in Canada, I feel the need to confront the ways in which ancient literature, classical literature, Roman, Latin literature, is implicated in colonial projects, and not only in our past. I initially imagined my work in Jesuit archives as an opportunity to read otherwise. Right? an opportunity to redirect my disciplinary training in classics to a context more immediate, right? And more, immediate more immediately relevant to contemporary questions. Maybe more immediately relevant to the kinds of questions that I find myself asking as a settler here in Canada. I've come to understand instead, and, and this is no novel observation, that the archive is a site of occlusion. The archives hide things just as much as they reveal them. And contemporary archival scholarship is complicit in those practices of concealment. Here's uh, Anne Laura Stoller one last time. Colonial archives, she says, have a way of drawing our attention to their own scripted temporal and spatial designations of what is colonial and what is no longer, making it difficult to stretch beyond their guarded frames. She writes, qualified and celebrated memories black out censor lines. No longer sure that this kind of reception-oriented project weakens the durability of any colonial formations, the structure of my discipline, you can see that in a lot of ways, this is really traditional scholarship that I'm doing. I'm reading literature, I'm tracking references. 
but at the very least, I hope that the act of commemoratio, of commemoration at the center of this poem and of this paper, the qualified and celebrated memory of Paul Hagenau in the words of his brother Francois, can serve as a reminder for us, not just of what classical literature reveals about the past, about our past here in Canada, but also what it could hide. In calling the ancient past into the present, we're like Francois Hagenau, we're like Félix Martin, active participants in the work of making historical memory through classical literature in Canada. What stories, what lives do we commemorate when we do this work? Thank you.